everyone. I uh, hope you're doing well and uh, also getting ready for uh, the holidays. Thanks a lot for joining us today. So uh, David did, did give a really nice intro to the firm, Hyman's Robertson. I'd like to do also my, my wee small part there. So we're one, we're one of the leading consultancies in our field in the UK. You heard that we're, we're established for over 100 years. To be specific, that number is 101. Uh, so we're independent. Uh, we work alongside employers, trustees, and financial services institutions. And we offer uh, pensions, investments, uh, benefits, and risk consulting services, as well as data and technology solutions. Uh, as David mentioned, please have a look at our website. We're constantly expanding, so you might find something interesting uh, for you there. Now, going, going to our session today. So our session today is about empowering people with uh, data-driven insights, and we'll showcase a couple of different ways that we've accomplished that in the firm. We will not be extremely technical, mainly because we don't have the time to do that. Uh, uh, but please feel free to get in touch with us after the session, and more than happy to chat about any of these things even more. So who are these people that we want to empower? You see them a bit in the pyramid uh, uh, there. So they could be anything from uh, business leaders, consultants, and clients, or uh, end consumers. Now, going to my talk specifically, I'm going to showcase a bit how you could use data science techniques to promote cross-selling opportunities and understand client needs. Now, a bit of uh, the obligatory background slide deck. Uh, okay, that's a bit, right now I see it, and it's a bit sad because half of my life it's inside three circles, but let's forget about that. So you'll see, uh, you'll see that my background is on mathematics, statistics, and machine learning. And for the last uh, almost three years, I'm working as a data scientist within the firm, within Hyman's Robertson, and I'm currently leading a small uh, modeling team called Model Prototyping Lab. Now, one of the team's goals is to add value, especially in supporting decision-making and increased model quality uh, across the firm. We're working on a variety of projects with different business units, and today I'll showcase two of those completed projects. And I'll start with the one that I've titled as Winning Work Using Data. And this is work primarily done by one of our anal analysts, Peter Nelson. Uh, I, don't want to, I don't want to do a data science talk where I have to give a data science definition on that talk because that thing doesn't exist. But there is, there is one that a definition, let's say, that I agree the most with. And this is the one by uh, Kasi Kozirkov, chief data scientist at Google, that she says that data science is the discipline of making data useful. So how does usefulness look like in this sort of setting? Well, it could be that you have a question that is actually, how can we more effectively win work with existing clients? Now, going back to that definition of making data useful, um, well, hopefully you have some data on your clients. And the whole idea there is that if you take advantage of your data in a specific technique, at the end, you're going to get some insight. So now going a bit even more specific right now about what I'm going to show you really soon, uh, our data from some of our clients come from Microsoft Dynamics. Uh, we're going to take advantage of market basket analysis, a specific technique. And, well, let's leave a bit of a cliffhanger ending there. You're going to find out really soon what happens there. Uh, now, what is market basket analysis? And the whole idea comes actually from supermarkets and actually carrying a basket. So imagine that you have a basket uh, that has uh, apples and bananas. But well, then there is a really high probability that if you have those things inside your basket, you'd like to add an orange or a lemon there. I'd let you decide what that is. Closer to a lemon, I think. Uh, now, why, why is this important? What, what, what can the supermarket do, actually, knowing this? Well, you can actually place related items together. And this is what is actually happening a lot of times. And this is a sort of win-win situation because they're also helping uh, the consumer to actually get what they want in a really easy way. Now going to the financial services world here, so you could imagine that you have specific propositions associated with your clients, and I put a couple of propositions there, and you could say, well, you know what? Actually, the clients that have these propositions, 
could actually be interested in another proposition, a really specific additional proposition. Now, again, why is this interesting? Well, you could actually target your marketing activities based on this knowledge. So overall, if you could, if you could try to summarize everything just in one sentence is, we can predict what, client, what clients might be interested in, given what they currently hold. Now, going a bit from the, from let's say a bit of the theoretical aspect to a bit of the output, uh, hopefully you can uh, see my uh, slide right now. Can I get a yes, David? You can get a yes. Looks good. Perfect. Perfect. That's good. You had me scared for a moment. That's good. So, so this is an app that essentially uh, applies uh, the things that I mentioned earlier. Uh, so as an example here, you could select the proposition and let's go at data cleansing. It takes a couple of questions, it a couple of seconds so you could see your current clients uh, on the left-hand side and the client directors. By the way, you'll see that everything is anonymized. And on the right-hand side, you see the recommended clients and the associated ranking behind it. So the higher, the better, the higher the probability that this client will be interested in this. So obviously you could use it in the way that uh, you're imagining, let's say that I am person W34. I'm not, but let's say that I am. Uh, it's it's reassuring to see, oh, yes, I have three clients on this proposition, but what are the clients that I could actually offer this proposition to? Oh, there are actually a couple of clients that may be interested in this. You could see it also from a different perspective of actually being a person that doesn't have any clients currently on this proposition. But that doesn't necessarily mean that there are no recommended clients for you. So there are possible clients that you could offer this proposition to, and especially one with a really high ranking. So there is a really good probability that they will like it. So there are a couple of more things happening with this app, but I decided just to showcase uh, one of them there. So um, now going with a known smooth transition to the second part of my talk, which is understanding client needs. And this is a lot of work that's been done by our current. She was an intern with us last year. She's completing her studies at Glasgow Uni this year. And I'm going to talk a bit about sentiment analysis on the second half. Uh, so what is sentiment analysis? Uh, really simply, it's just a technique uh, that you're uh, trying to determine the sentiment behind a piece of text. So that could be positive, that could be negative, that could be neutral. And again, a reasoning of why would could somebody be interested in this? Well, uh, you could try to analyze your demands of clients. You could assess your brand reputation and also identify sentiment uh, uh, in social network data also associated with your account. Uh, so the next slide immediately feels, oh, that's a lot of things happening. And that's the whole point for my second half of the talk. Uh, at the first half, I just showed you immediately the output, uh, but on this one, I just wanted to have, for all of you to have a bit of an overview of the methodology. And you see the whole process from the top to the bottom are split in four sections. So the first three, uh, the ones at the top, uh, are actually necessary in order to uh, actually feel confident that the technique has everything it needs in order to give you a trustworthy output. So you see from the left to the right, you see there is a lot of cleaning on the text data because email data can be very messy. There is a lot of pre-processing on text data for any of you out there that you've worked either with sentiment analysis or NLP or similar techniques, you'll know that you'll need to do a lot of things, tokenizing, stop words, a lot of stuff like that. And for the final sec the, the third section, the tidying text data, that's a bit more for the R high diverse people out there, that's, uh, you need to format your data at the end in a specific uh, way. Now, these three sections, besides being, uh, besides being uh, extremely important, at the same time, they're extremely undervalued. Uh, even myself, earlier on the previous case study, I focused immediately on the output without knowing what's happening uh, behind the scenes. Right now, I'm going to do a bit of the opposite. And uh, the whole idea here is that what, what a lot of you already know, that uh, there is no clean data. There is a lot of work that you need to do to reach the point where you need to apply that technique. So as an example, 
you see on the top here, uh, this is actually one email on the top, and that's the HTML code that we get there. It will take you a bit of time to actually try to find the text there, but I've also put the clean text on the bottom there for you. So you need to find an automated way of actually doing this. You obviously don't want to be doing this uh, email by email. Another thing that could be happening is you could have email threads. Uh, so you see on the table on the top, you see um, a back and forth conversation between Ava and Jessica. Ava says the weather is nice today. Obviously, as David said, uh, Ava is not in the UK currently. So she says the weather is nice today. Jessica responds, I agree, Ava. But because she responded on the original email, if you clean the text the way you did it before, actually the text from Ava will also appear there. And you don't want to be counting the same text multiple times when you need to assess the sentiment of emails. So you need to find also an automated way to remove all these threads and keep only things once. And another thing that is also happening is you have a lot of messages uh, around taking caution when opening up an email that is outside your company. So company specific messages about confidentiality or authorizations, it could be about copyright. It could be about warnings that are unique to companies. So you see a bit of that on the top or on the bottom uh, there on this uh, slide deck. So all these things need to be removed because, well, first of all, they're not associated at all with the actual analysis that we want to do. And besides that, even if you think a bit about it, is a lot of these messages actually have negative connotations. There is a lot of warning, caution, things like that, that we don't want uh, these words to actually mess up the actual things that we're interested in. So this is a lot of uh, behind the scenes uh, work. Now I'm going to go immediately at uh, the end due to the lack of time. Uh, and I just want to showcase a bit of the output that you could get from an analysis like that. And you'll see right now um, the frequency of words associated with various sentiments. And here I have six different sentiments. So we can go, we can go on the um, uh, bottom left on the positive sentiment. And you'll see some words associated with this sentiment. It's it's nice, it's reassuring always to see that something that comes out of it is something that doesn't feel strange, that you expected those words there. You could also be thinking right now, okay, wait a minute. Just by looking at that graph, what, what could I actually get? Well, you could, you could use a graph like this in a variety of ways, but one of them could be, it's not just looking at this graph, it's, it could be that you're looking at similar graphs year by year, and you want to make comparisons what happened this year that didn't happen last year? And why was that the case? In a similar way, if you go at the uh, top right, at the negative sentiment, uh, you see there the words associated with the negative sentiment, and you'll see the question appears there. The, quest, the word question appears there at the top. And there were a couple of reasons behind that, actually. Uh, but again, if you're, if, you're, if you're in a solutions mode right now, or in a why are we doing this, uh, how could that be helpful? It could be that when you see that word question appear there at the top, and then you go and try to reassure yourself, go at all those emails in a nice way, nice and quick way to see how was that word actually uh, being used. You could see that maybe, oh, your clients have a lot of questions about specific things. So a way, a way to actually uh, help with this is, could it be that if you create a, maybe a frequently asked questions section somewhere on the website? That, that could be helpful. So you're essentially helping them a lot and you're also helping internally the people not having to deal with a large volume of emails. So those are just a couple of different ways that you could take advantage of uh, graphs and output uh, like this. And in general, um, I hope I gave you a, just a, a, a wee flavor of a couple of different projects that my team uh, was responsible uh, the last year. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for listening.